Coming in. Okay, recording has begun. Okay, people are starting to file in now. Good, good. Welcome, everybody. Come on in. Come on in and have a virtual seat. I'm going to get started in just a minute, maybe, maybe less. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, I think I'll I'll go ahead and get started, and then uh, people will no doubt pop in as we're you know getting going. All right. So uh, hello and welcome to the fifth uh, session of the fall 2022 Sarah Little Turnbull Visiting Designer Spe Speaker Series, where we talk to various luminaries in the world of design, science, activism, and tonight we're going to talk about an artist and his work. This semester, we are focusing on cross-cultural design, looking at how UX designers uh, and artists should best respond to users in and from different cultures. How do artists and designers respond to different ontologies or worldviews? Uh, what happens when different cultures mix? How do we harness the dialogue between different cultures, uh, the cultural dialogue? And how does this mixture of cultures reverberate down through history and affect the culture we live in today? Uh, this series of talks is running concurrently with Abya Yala, the Structural Origins. It's the current exhibition in the Lehman College Art Gallery, uh, which uh, this semester is participating in the New York Latin American Art Triennial. Uh, the, our guest tonight is also in the show, uh, so we can talk a little bit about his work in the show. This exhibition uh, opened on September 21st and will conclude on January 28th. Um, and I, you know, we'll look at uh, tonight's guest and his work, and we'll look at his work on screen, and we'll talk a little bit about it, but you really should go there in person and see it. It's really something. Um, this also, I should also add, this lecture series is a component of a design course uh, being run by Professor Sean Chang tonight, and every, all, every week this semester, the students in this class are here tonight, virtually, um, and they'll be interacting, hopefully, with us to the Q&A section which I also welcome uh, anyone who's uh, attending from the public. If you're not in the class, that's cool too. Uh, feel free to ask any questions in the Q&A. Um, and as I was just I was just talking to our guests, we're gonna try not to talk too much amongst ourselves and try to uh, open up questions, although we do have a ton to talk about. My, my guest tonight is Edward duval Carrier, an artist whose work is currently on display, as I said, in the Lehman College Art Gallery. Uh, Edward was born in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, and his family emigrated to Puerto Rico during the Francois Duvalier regime when he was just a child. Uh, Duval Carrier studied at the University de Montreal and McGill University in Canada before graduating with a Bachelor of Arts from Loyola, uh, sorry, Loyola College in Montreal in 1978. He later attended the École des Beaux-Arts in Paris, France from 1988 to 1989. He resided in France for many years, but he currently lives in Miami, Florida. Uh, he lives among Miami's substantial uh, Haitian immigrant population and, man and maintains cultural ties to his homeland. <clears throat> I've asked him uh, to speak with us tonight because uh, in the world's words of Paul Neal, he is an artist of both the modern and colonial worlds and incorporates the very products of modernity into his work from plastics to photographs, cleverly juxtaposing refined materials with images to critique the processes of modern fabrication through historical systems of oppression, stratification, and invisibility. His work really rests upon the crossroads between colonized power and the indigenous world. And that's sort of what Abhi Ayala, the, the exhibition is about, but it's also in some ways what this whole lecture series this semester has been about, which is, different cultures blending and what happens when that when that occurs. Edward, thank you so much for being here with us tonight uh, on election night, one of the biggest nights of our lives. <laughs> uh, yeah, it is, indeed. <laughs> Especially in your state. Um, so yeah. thank you for being here. I, I You had sent me some um, of your work 
uh, a, a presentation that I'm going to bring up right now. And the very first uh, image, and just uh, you could see the work on the screen. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, so this piece, uh, tell us about this piece and, and take us yeah. through this presentation here. Right. I started in, uh, dry, uh, uh, doing dry points on plexiglass, and this is the largest uh, that I've made at this point. It's uh, quite large. It's yeah. Eight, eight, eight feet tall by 12 um, or 16, and it's very large. And um, I cannot imagine that I sat down and did that. Every time I look at it, my hands are hurt. So <laughs> for, from scratching the, the plexiglass. Anyways, uh, I wanted to portray, uh, I mean, Haiti is a very particular place, not in the sense that first Black Republic, uh, and uh, since day one, they've, they've tried and, and attempted to, I mean, many forms of government. And one of the most like, elaborate and most uh, uh, curious was the North Kingdom of Haiti, when the Republic, the newly formed republics, uh, split in two. In the north, we had a kingdom with Henry Christophe, one of a kind. And in the south, a very Republican uh, tied to, uh, not even tied, but, you know, in the, in the mode of the French uh, Republic, uh, which mm -hmm. had just... Uh, um, become you know republic itself um it is it is uh i just wanted to show the pomp and 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 uh, and the way um and the complexity of, of the situation of a king uh with with a newly formed uh, government governing you know like a multitude of former slaves stemming from every corner of africa because yeah. uh as we know, the French, you know, like came late into the in, into securing slaves for their plantations, and mainly the the, the plantations in in Saint Domingue, Haiti, and managed, you know, like by the time Haiti of, of Haitian Revolution, uh, there were more than five hundred thousand slaves on the, on the, I mean working and tilling the land, compared to maybe like forty thousand, a bit more, yeah. Maybe, yeah. Of, of colonists from France. So that was a very tenuous situation. And and this is the piece that's in the art gallery right now, right? Yes, it is. Okay. okay. I mean, they asked me to participate in in this in this uh, triennial and then yeah. should have gone to New York to check it out. But I mean, you can tell me a little bit more about it. <laughs> anyway, I hope that the work is very large. I hope it fits somewhere, you know? So. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, it's, it's right in a very, you'd be very happy with the spot. I love it where it is. I happen to be walking opening night like the day of opening night so they were still kind of like just setting up and i happened to just walk walk around and i turned around and this was like staring me in the face i was really like a foot from it and and that was actually kind of interesting because it is huge right it is quite large as you said and it really it you have to you have to go back like 10 feet to really it's like a big screen tv right it's like Sometimes they're too big, right? I had to go back a certain distance to really take the whole thing in the way I'm, we're taking it in right now. But because I was so close, it kind of, it was an interesting experience because you could see like each scratch that you had made, like your hand was in it, you know, in an interesting way. So this is, it's one of those works that like really demands two vantage points, you kind of have to be back here to see the whole narrative and take it in. But then you really should also go up close and see the the actual technique and the gesture. It's really, it's pretty incredible. Uh, shall I go to the next slide? Sure. Okay. Well, these are the drawings for for these things because you have to do the drawings. I mean, quite specifically, so you can put the plexi on it and scratch. And uh, um, so, I mean, the image is representing that king, King Henry Christophe, who was probably of uh, a I mean, from Jamaica, I think, or one of the English island and had and had been brought or or emigrated to Haiti. I don't know how exactly. Never really, uh, I mean, give gave details on that. Anyways, he had an affinity with England, and uh, after his suicide, his wife and and two girls left for England, where recently they found a house. I mean, they realized this house, this lady lived in it, and she was the queen of Haiti. Anyways, I mean, I wanted to uh, portray that. Um, 
because um, they had a field day with uh, yeah, with uh, the Europeans had a field day with uh, with the idea of a black king and uh, and of course you know like they put him in a garb and he was quite um, a satire uh, about him where you know he was wearing probably too much clothes for the heat in Haiti et cetera et cetera and of course I mean from their point of view it was you know like I mean be, uh, a kingdom bound to 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 fail because you know like they were just mimicking according to them you know like the the precepts of a republic etc anyways uh, me I think I have another take on it this this is uh, an attempt you know like at many forms of government that Haiti has tried over the years and I'm and I still think that this is uh how would I say it? I mean, we are still learning and, and, and figuring out how to govern ourselves. When you think about it, I mean, you think black and it's one homogeneous kind of people? Hardly. I mean, the, the, I mean there were the tribes, there are kingdoms, there are all sorts of things in Africa. And people in Haiti, in particular the French, you know, like had to scrounge all over West Africa to find slaves because once a slave left Africa and was destined to Saint-Domingue, I mean, the, the word out was that they would not last four years. So that was like a sentence to death to go to, to that place. And um, so they were constantly uh, purchasing slaves and bringing slaves to, to the island. So by the time of the Haitian Revolution, probably half of the, half of the uh, population, the slave population, was, you know, like first generation. And um, that's also a problem. I mean, I'm not here to give a course on Haitian history, but I just wanted to put this in, in, in a context where people could see why I wanted to do that. I mean, the, the, the difficulties of any government, you know, like to govern, uh, especially such a disparate kind of uh, um, a group of individuals. And I portray that, you know, like with trying to, you know, emulate African masks, you know, on faces of everybody. So, I mean, you can, if you, anybody knows anything about African art, I mean, they'll be able to, I mean, realize that, you know, like these are very varied groups that are not, you know, like in the same area, probably, you know, like, I mean, which brings to mind that Haiti probably is the first, you know, like pan-African state. Yeah, you know? yeah. That's what yeah. It, I really think it is. Yeah, interesting. All right. So here, I, this is the original uh, work that I've used. And as you can see, you know, like they've really you know, layered this, this, this very luxur luxurious kind of cloth on him. And probably that was the, the days where, um, I mean, for his, his coronation, because I think that's what it was. Um, and and there on on on, the, on, on his side, you know, I mean, he's like one of the oldest probably paintings in Haiti, and they represent his his family. I mean, his kids at least. The two girls are Amethyst and Top Topaz, I remember if I remember correctly, and Prince Henry Eugène. Um, I mean, it's quite a lovely portrait, and it already has all the the the, the characteristics of Haitian art. I mean, and these are two centuries, you know, like almost by now. Anyways, a lot to talk about. Um, I mean, I, I, I usually do work, I mean, do projects, you know, and work in, in and I try to find something uh, different to, to um, bring to a, any exhibit that I do. And this one, it was, uh, it was a series of, a, a, of kaleidoscopic kind of, you know, like images that tells each one told a story about the discovery about the this one is about the discovery per se i mean others touched on you know like uh, the uh, the colonization the uh, the the destruction of the taino and arawak civil i mean people in 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 on the island uh the exploitation that started immediately after because haiti was first contact that's the place where columbus stayed and uh, and since day one, I mean, you can see in these particular images, are, which are taken from Theodore de Brie's uh, um, book, I mean, pamphlet that was distributed widely during the the, the re re reform in uh, in Europe. Um, 
and it's based on the letters of Bartolomé de las Casas to the Pope, where he complained that the Spaniards were a bunch of uh, savages that had gone to a place with very innocent and and unrefined and, and probably uncivilized people and just put them to work to uh, find, uh, look for gold, for all sorts of things. They started, you know, sugar cane. And, you know, like, this is like maybe a decade. Um, uh, he had gone with Columbus first trip and went back to, on, on the third trip, which was in, in an, an interval of 20 years. And he witnessed the, you know, like literally, literally the destruction of you know like of the place and of the people that lived in it and it was quite a lot of people and this is you know i mean the only document i mean the, that uh, that tells that particular story of of uh, a genocide you know against a um, i mean a, a population that was defenseless and um, not counting all the diseases that were brought from europe to the americas Anyways, I just, I mean, and, and these are, of course, uh, deep, I mean, they are, how would I say, uh, they are floating, all these images are floating in resin with a bunch of other things. And I mean, they just, you know, like are things that are, you know, like, I mean, it's not detritus really, but it's like, you know, like things that, you know, like are gone by the wayside, per se. I mean, as you can see, the, I've, I've just chosen a few images to show you how I, I work and how I develop. This is from a very peculiar, uh, the first colored uh, lithograph ever made, which was done to portray the, uh, the, 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 the burning of Cape Haitian, which was the Pearl of the Antilles at, back then. It was the seat of the French government on the island. And um, it, it was, I mean, uh, it, when Napoleon decided to invade the island, he ma managed to sell the Louisianas to the American, recoup some money to send an armada of probably 75, you know, like gunboats and, and 100,000 troops. And uh, they were massacred. And the first, I mean, the first thing the Haitians did was to, I mean, set fire to the, to the major city there. And uh, they were shocked, and um, and they they've been crying ever since. The French, you know, like at the, at the loss of this of this um, major uh, uh, economic uh, powerhouse in the Americas. Yeah, I mean that brings up like um, something that now I can kind of see a theme emerging, right? Which is that the French, the British, the Dutch, um, they're is. in. Yeah, right. Their interest in the new world were really based on capital, right, and extracting, extracting well, resources, wealth. Yeah, it, we, you know, we're. It's funny. Like we're told the story as Americans. At least I was told the story that uh, colonists came here for for religious freedom. Like that's the you know that's the narrative that we're we're told. But I mean, the re the reality is, since I mean, the whole even before 1492, the reason for coming here had nothing to do with the Reformation. Um, this is hundred centuries before, and the reason is always about land acquisition and wealth, right, and capital extraction of wealth. And then here's this example of of a an island, a nation that was really, in in some ways, just an outpost to generate wealth for the French. And it wound up going awry, and 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 like it, it now you you know and then here you have this example of like Napoleon selling whole swaths of indigenous territory to America, and it just I could just see this theme forming that a lot of the culture that exists in the Americas at this time was really not a result of of uh, religious pilgrimage or even the spread of of ideas or religion it's really the spread of extractive uh, politics and extractive policies that just burn themselves down eventually and then in the ruins we have like these different you know forms of imitative republics and and you know at best and i just i think that's really interesting i want to keep you know talking about this but let's keep looking at your um at the work here that's the original oh, email okay so you, you said this is the first color lithograph yeah 
I mean, uh, wow. well, from a, the person that's, that uh, gave me that image, um, yeah, I have it in my in my collection, and he said that it is literally the first. I mean, at, at, at color, uh, coloring, you know, like a, a black and white. I mean, yeah, done with it mechanically. Not, I mean, it was not given to somebody to paint over it. Yeah, yeah, no, it's beautiful. Yeah, it. I mean, it's really amazing how they captured. Like, I'm just looking, you know, just a second to reflect on the the formal qualities, like how they captured the light. The, the fire shining off the water that's right in front, mm -hmm. you know, where the boats are sort of docked is just incredible. I mean, it's it's really, really well done, really well rendered. And uh, apparently the, the 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 city burned for three months and you could see it. I mean, uh, from Cuba and wow. from in Jamaica, um, you could see the fire going on. So it's... It wow. was um, this is part of another group of works that I did for the, the back then when I did it uh, for the Brindley, uh New um, Perez Museum here in Miami. It was it's quite a it's quite a sight. It's like literally, literally for Miamians, it's like they're Parthenon, you know. It's like yeah, really, <laughs> it's quite <laughs> extraordinary. Uh, so they gave me the second exhibit. I mean, a major exhibit there, and I had to build a body of work to. I mean, to, to discuss this whole 19th century and how they perceive the, the, the tropics. And, um, and uh, of course, the, um, it was Dury Monroe, probably, and uh, they were with this, and his doctrine of America for the Americans. I mean, the, whatever that meant. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he, to facilitate this, uh, they had a series of exhibits and a lot of artists, American artists, especially the group from the Hudson School went down to the Caribbean and to South America and did quite a survey. Um, and one of them also, you know, like was um, a major artist that did, and this painting is the landing of Columbus. And I just wanted to, to play with that, you know, the idea in the boat you have, you know, like all the portents of, North American and European, you know, like uh, figures, power figures. I mean, from Minnie Mouse to Columbus himself. <laughs> and 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 how is this? Uh, you use, it's mixed media on aluminum, but could you just talk a little bit about the process? Because it's got yeah. like a very bizarre sort of magical look to it. It is painted with literally, uh, I mean, yes, the backgrounds are paint, but uh, all of these um, white streaks and stuff like that is, I literally used a, uh, um, tubes of a uh, glitter glue, silver glitter glue, and that's what gives you these these intonations, you know. So that's yeah. another, you know, I mean, trying to do something different. So the whole yeah. group of works that they were in that show were in this. Uh, they were quite large as well, ninety four, yeah. one forty four, as it says here. And uh, at, when I f did the first ones, I realized that the the, the glitter did not stick. To the to the to the surface. So what I had to do was to uh, apply a, a coat of resin. I mean, of epoxy resin, so that it kept you know like its shine and stuff like that. It added to the to the to the look of the piece. I mean, of course, they're done in pieces. There are six pieces or eight pieces in this one, um, and um, presented it presented directly on the walls, no frames or nothing. Anyways, it was quite an exhibit. And if you visit Miami, half of them, if not three quarters of these works were purchased by the airport and they are in display there. Because it is talking about the American. So, I mean, of course, I I, I acknowledge the artists that, that made those works. I mean, John, Martin Johnson Heed, for example, this, did this uh, Fern Alley which was, you know, like small, a smallish painting. And of course I blew it up and, and dumped a, a, a very sinister looking kind of character in the middle of it. Because I mean, you know, like all of the, the I mean, my, my point was where did all these colors come from? You know, like this palette that is used so much to describe, you know, like the Caribbean and, and other exotic places. And it's these artists that, that, that went down and, of course, we're interested in, in presenting the foliage, the, I mean, like the botanical studies and, and the landscapes and stuff like that. So 
I mean, I really worked deliberately from their work and just brought it at one specific time of the day, which is uh, probably at dusk, you know, I mean, after a, after a light rain and everything shines really when yeah, under the moonlight. So this is what I did about 11 of 12 of those that were in that exhibit. And now this is a very interesting uh, project that I did. I was invited by the, the museum in uh, the National Gallery of Johannesburg. And as we understand, or as I understand it, they were very interested in the first Black Republic. And uh, of course, they're the latest Black Republic. Because, I mean, since the collapse and the, the erasure of apartheid, I mean, at a certain point, um, so they've invited me and they wanted me, they wanted me to give, um, I mean, to explain Haiti to them visually. So, I mean, my first project, my first part of the group was, of these, the group of works to illustrate that, was a series of, I, I went back and looked at all of these portraits. And what's very interesting about them is that they, they are Black men, you know, I mean, just probably out of, out, out of slavery that adopt, you know, like, I mean, positions, their leaders of their people, and they adopt, you know, like the garbs of, you know, like Republican statesmen. And I've always found this very peculiar. And to them, it will be peculiar because these are the first, so I mean, this is like early 19th, early 19th century to mid 19th century. Um, and I've converted them. I mean, let's go to the next one probably into these portraits. I mean, it doesn't translate, but these are mirrors. So uh, they are engraved on mirrors. And I did um, literally about 15 uh, of the first group of, and I'm supposed to do more. The exhibit never took place because they're still, I mean, it's still slotted. I mean, we'll do it in due time, but um, yeah, because of COVID, the, the whole project, you know, like not that it collapsed. I mean, they, they, are, print, they are going to print a book and everything. And uh, I, I mean, the first complete group of work, because I mean, I had about five different things that I wanted to, to present uh, over there. And these are, the, these are, you know, like I really found that interesting, you know, like to, I mean, especially to, to South African, because if, if, I mean, yes, you know, like they are, they are a modern nation, but I mean, they, they, Africa has its kings, has its, has its tribal leaders, all sorts of things, you understand, and they adopt, you know, like they're very close to their, and uh, to their uh, heritage. But how do you, in a place like Haiti, how do you, uh, uh, you know, rally, I mean, hundreds of tribes, you know, like, I mean, the, the people from so, such different states, you know, like into one by one, I mean, it's not possible. So they, they decided to adopt, you know, like the European garbs and, you know, like the, what they thought were, you know, like symbols of power. Anyway, so that was the project. And I've, and I've blown a, a few of them up into very large scale. Let's see where they are. Go ahead. There they are. And oh, these, they're huge. Okay. Huge. So, I mean, they're very interesting. I mean, wow. Of, of scratching, you know, mirrors where I'm looking at myself. It's funny. It's, I'm, I'm surprised that they all don't look like me because that's all I have. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait. So, so these are, uh, how big are these mirrors? Like maybe the, 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 the larger ones are, I mean, probably about eight feet by, you know, like, uh, I mean, five. And yeah, uh, ones up smallish, you know. I mean, smallish. I mean, four, 30 by thirty inch. And then they get blown up and printed. Like these are prints, right? They're not. Uh, no, 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 no. They are engraved on plexiglass. Oh right? wow! Okay, I understand. Yes. yes, they are engraved again and cut out. You know, I can't. You know, because it would have. Yeah. To give them shape and become a bit more sculptural. Wow, those are incredible. Uh. Wow. This this year, yeah, yes, the year is not even. Uh, I was asked by the funny enough and interestingly enough, the U, the University of Miami's business school, to create a piece for their atrium, which was, I mean, this very large glass cubicle, um, which is twenty feet high. I mean, you know, like, and they asked me to 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 see what I could concoct for 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 the entrance of the business school. And I decided to give, I mean, my version of the, the history of the Floridas. 
I mean, in the bottom is, of course, the landing of Europeans. I mean, this, I mean, the, the, the whole history of Florida is wrought with, I mean, I, I mean, they just, the Spaniards just literally abandoned it and said to the United States, if you want it, just take it, you know, I mean, it was, there was no fight over it. There were, of course, um, later fights against all the, all the, the American Indians that were that had in, in black slaves that had run down you know like to escape um slavery and thinking that they you know like the spaniards would protect them but you know like they were left stranded and of course it took like andrew jackson and others you know like to quell these these characters down so that's part of the story another part of the story is of course this caribbean and south american immigration by both people, of course, Haitian, Cubans, and, and the rest of the lot. And at the same time, you know, like stemming from these islands that are a, a boats leaving Miami, I mean, and to go and uh, visit these paradise islands, which people are fleeing from. So it's, uh, it's, it's I mean, we, Florida is a very peculiar place. And at the end, I mean, I looked into, you know, the possibilities, you know, like of energies, I mean, so nuclear energy, I mean, yeah. they, they are not really too, I mean, people are not too happy because of the hurricanes to have such things. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. One, yeah. So the one that is, you know, like a potentially very in, a, a positive, you know, like environmentally and et cetera, et cetera, are solar panels, which are in the left here. Okay. Yes. So I, mean, yeah. I just wanted to just give um, an overview. How, so, so how I'm, I'm just interested in in within the context of this idea of of capital and and extraction and and in you know for for the benefit of businesses and you know industry. How did um, how did the, the the University of Miami Business School take you know how did they, how was this received by them well they were i mean they wanted to i mean a friend i mean they, they don't ask an artist to censor him you know so right yeah right. i mean at least that they never they, but i i mean we discussed on 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 the history which is fraught with issues and fraught with yeah. you know, sad sad stories yeah and, you know like at the same time you know i mean it's a place which is despite its um I mean, everything, I mean, you know, we probably will, I mean, Miami will not be there if, if we have yeah. a, a unsympathetic government. That's uh, right. Yeah. Uh, to the cause. Uh, and um, it, it's still a very interesting place. And also Miami per se, where I live right now, has become uh, this, this megalopolis. And they are, you know, I mean, there are people from everywhere here. So yeah. it's like yeah. really, uh, attracting and also the city elders have always been, I don't know why, but very keen on uh, on creating like a beautiful place. I mean, really, Miami has become, when I first came to now, this is a, I mean, like a very beautiful city, you know? Like, yeah. Uh, which is under the sun, you know, like palm trees and highways. I mean, what a contradiction, you know? Yeah, no, totally. I I'm, I'm wondering, like, what is it about and you might not be able to answer this, but what Miami is like a very beautiful city. It's like a, it's like the South East jewel, right? There's New York, there's Miami, you know, there's LA and then I don't know, Portland, I guess. I don't know. Um, but like or Seattle. Chicago, you forget that one. Yeah, Chicago, right, right in the middle. Yeah. So like the, you know, what is it what is it about Miami? What is it about the culture? And I'm wondering if it has related to the Hispan ties to, to Hispanic cultures that that it like it needs to like there's you know art basil basil Miami's there like what is it about the arts in Miami like where is that all coming from where's that energy coming from well it is I mean it is the south I mean to me this this Miami should be the capital of the United States and it would be <laughs> the capital of the Americas Mm -hmm. because, like I mean, it's centrally geographic, geographically central to both True. the continents, yeah. and um, and it has, you know, like I mean, the propensity of uh, having such this such varied uh, uh, ethnic and and different people. Yeah. I mean, Europeans, yeah. Africans. I mean, I didn't know there was a very large Nigerian population here. 
I mean, it's like they, I heard one day that there were 165 different, uh, a, I mean, political, I mean, like, what do you say, nations here. Yeah. yeah national identities and whatever and they and they i mean we don't have you know ethnic uh, or racial fights there were some in the time that sometimes i mean it's still very difficult place it still has this um remnants of of south of the south yeah you know of uh, the american south but i mean it's it, now i call it you know like the north of the caribbean <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fair enough. But before we move on, there is one question about. Let me go back to this piece. There's a key, there's a question here, and I'll read it to you, and you can do you can answer it. In after Bierstadt, the landing boat, besides Minnie, Mickey, Bugs Bunny, Batman, and Mr. Potato Head, who are the remaining figures, and oh, why did you? Yeah, I, I know. I, see Columbus, obviously, but Columbus and Marie oh. Antoinette. Ah, uh, Marie Antoinette. How could okay. I miss? I, how could I miss this, uh, this? Yeah, I mean, visiting the. I mean, visiting. That's something that she would do. You know. Yeah, yeah, Being yeah. That's exactly it. right. The the last sort of queen, the last uh, aristocrat of the before the revolution, right? Right. Like yeah. she, she kind of represents the excess of of the monarchy in France prior to the revolution. This guy, okay. And then I see Daffy Duck or Donald, I don't know. I assume that's who that is. And okay. Batman also is, yeah. uh, I mean, be, being the brave one to jump in, you know, like to, to land. Yeah. It's funny because like these are all sort of well, the the figures, the, the characters, the non-human characters, let's say, are all sort of representative of American soft power, right? The, our cultural power and how, and that's really one of the things that has, colonize the rest of the world it's <laughs> right disney and and our our cultural tokens are everywhere right and and they've traveled farther than any of our any military craft could ever go right and they've had more influence over time so i think it's really interesting that they're coming off of a gunship right in the yes. in the harbor right and coming ashore it's like pretty fascinating and you've 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 sort of like alluded to how they've become weaponized is like they're kind of like they are powerful they have a power and it's a cultural power and i just think that's really it's really fascinating all right so let's um yes here we are okay we're back to where we were and this is the beast of burden and of course he's black and he's got the world on his back so mm -hmm. just to play on that and yeah so and then this is also really large. This is yes. mix mixed media on aluminum. The same, the, the same, the same. I've managed, you know, like to eliminate the resin because I mean it's a very difficult uh, uh, media. I mean, the sense yeah. it doesn't age very well, and okay. uh, so I just use I mean proper varnish, and it keeps the the the, the glitter. I mean, fixed. And, and below on the on the underside, where like this the glowing sort of water. Effect is, is that is that oil or is that some kind of varnish or? Uh, it's it's the varnish that that. Okay. That, that yeah, it's, it's really striking, and it's it's the contrast between like the black, the glitter, the you know the white of the which is the aluminum, I imagine, and then this sort of blue, blue green lagoon thing. It's just really, it's really striking. I mean, it's really intense. Um, it's you know, and I wonder again. You said, are you you're you're kind of like hearkening back to the the culture of the Caribbean, right? Like the colors that we associate with yes, the Caribbean, with the, and yes. the tropics. I mean, okay, I I love to I love to do that and exaggerate them because I mean, I, and it's yeah. not real because I mean, you know, I'm yeah, yes, it's some not real. Places, yeah, there's some places that have you know, like I mean, pristine, you know, like. Uh, uh, I mean, seacoast and stuff like that with with this, you know, like blue green kind of colors and so yeah, very rarely, you know. Yeah, that's not that's what we're sold like in the in the pamphlets and on the website. But in reality, there's this the, the seedy underbelly of post colonialism and post slavery, which is really you know once once all the hey, tourists leave, you know, that's what's left. That's what's left, which is really sad in a way. All right. Um, Oh, here's another quick question from the Q&A uh, that we can, I mean, this is a perfect piece to rest on. 
you first of all, your work is absolutely beautiful. I agree. How long does it take for a piece like this to be completed? Uh, like, what's the process for that from start to finish? And I said, you, I know you said it was in panels and. Yeah, it's in panels yeah. because I mean, I, I, I don't want to. I mean, I don't want to. When I get tired, collapse from, yeah. the, from the scaffold. Of course. Um, yeah, so they're done in pieces, and I, I, I join them in the end, and um, and make it seamless. Um, it depends. I mean, if the idea is clear in my head, um, I've I've done enough of this so that I've become literally a master of spreading glitter from a tube because it doesn't you cannot do it with a with a uh, with a brush. And um, so I know how to do it. And it can, I mean, if the idea is there, I mean, it can go pretty fast, maybe three, four, maybe months, two months, you know, depending. Um, and, I'm, and I like to work. I mean, so I'm getting older, so I, I, I stay home. I don't go and jump around anymore. Well, you, well you're in Miami though. Come on, man. Uh, I mean, after a while, you just, you know, <laughs> you know, the beaches, I mean, literally, I mean, when I was three blocks away, First year every day. By the third, I, have, I get it. I, think, I mean, five years. I don't think I've seen the, the water. I mean, I've I get it. <laughs> I actually get that. I, I understand that. All right. So, oh, I think that might be it. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah, it. You are the end. So yes. We... Yeah. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop um, the share here. Okay. All right. So I I have some uh, questions. You know, you you work. Uh, um, I know a lot with print, right? And and I you know, and you like you understand print and and its effect on culture. We were talking before about um, you know the real reasons that the colonists came to the Americas was essentially based on extraction and, 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 and wealth to go back to, I mean, that's how Columbus and, and every other uh, conquistador sold it to the king and the queen of Spain. I'm gonna make you rich, right? There's gold there, there's, you know, resources, there's, there's, there's people, right? That we can steal and extract um, and, and eventually convert to Christianity, obviously. Uh, but, but the, but, there is there is a moment um, after the Reformation in Europe when people started flocking over for humanitarian reasons to the Caribbean, right? And it was all kind of driven through the Reformation through print, right? The the, the like the Reformation really was allowed and to to travel as it did because of of print, because of like the movable type printing press and. Uh, I think you know the printing of the Bible in different languages, right? Yes. That people could read and, uh, and, and, I think, the, and writing the histories and and proselytizing history as well as the victors saw it. You understand? I mean, I'm not saying that they 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 went out, you know, like to to be nefarious or anything like that. But I mean, yeah, yeah. It, it, but when you see, you know, like and, and I mean, it was from their point of view. So having you know like the the the, the technology, I mean through printing, uh, to disseminate ideas, disseminate histories, disseminate uh, facts in science, all sorts of things, and also to I mean the there was a larger uh, a endeavor which was to capture and and really create an, the archives of, of the world in print, you know. Yeah. I mean, I mean, make sure that every every known plant is there, every known animal. I mean, of course, mm -hmm. they've realized after a while that it was much more complicated. Yeah, it's impossible. Than, yeah, than possible. So, but the idea was there. So, um, the printing probably, you know, like created another um, a mechanism for Europe and and you know like to 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 become what it has become. You know, and. Uh, I I just think that's really it's it's interesting, or I guess it's I guess the word is ironic because, um, like Martin Luther, for example, the the famous um, reformist who you know his whole idea of um, translating the Bible into German and other languages was so that people in other cultures and other parts of the and this is why it was so valuable in other parts of the world could read 
the word of the Bible, the gospel in their own language, right? And, and translate it into their own language and then disseminate it, which is such a beautiful idea. I'm not a religious person, but that is for me the essence of what religion should be, right? This sort of shared cultural experience that can can transfer throughout different cultures, right? And as a designer, and, and that's a lot what we're talking about this semester, which is like, you know, is there a universal design? Is there like a, a universal language we can all speak in as designers, right? But the, uh, the irony for me is that that happened, that led to the Reformation, right? The Roman Catholic Church wanted the Bible to be in Latin, Hebrew for the Old Testament, and then, you know, Greek for the, the, the gospel. The sermons were all done in Latin. These were all sort of languages that at that point weren't spoken anymore, um, aside from Hebrew, right? In certain areas of the world and and that was for a good reason right it was a way to maintain a sort of administrative power over the the teachings and the writings of the, the roman catholic church and martin luther didn't like that so he thought let's translate the bible and then it's almost like that that same technology like the way you're describing it was used to create a, a to almost like recreate a monoculture with you know cataloging all these animals and, and species of plants and and really scientifically structuring it so that and and of course writing history so that it reflected the views and the desires of the of the the most powerful the the victors right thereby creating like a one another one world right that you're either in a you're one in, word one vision of the world yeah one vision of the world right that you're either in in and a part of and accepting of or you're a heretic wow. and yeah you're oh, out savage <laughs> yeah you're or a savage right which is which is another way to other i mean it's the classic othering of people so this technology which i've dedicated my life to print and, and typography and layout and all this beautiful this beautiful stuff that we do is like has been turned on its head from its original purposes or what it was really first so promising for into a into a tool for the oppressor like it's it's shocking to me and i just thought i was wondering if you could maybe comment on that for young designers in the room Yes, it, it is. It is a problematic kind of. At, I mean, when you look at it very deeply, I mean, yes, it is a tool. It has become a tool. And when now today, which is even more uh, uh, problematic and more alarming, is mm -hmm. the fact that lies can be, you know, like part of the and part and parcel of this of this dissemination of of whatever information you think you might yeah. have. I mean, yeah. You cannot even contradict it because you say it more than once. I mean, and the more you repeat it, the more real it becomes. Yeah. And 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 when you look at that today, and you look at the way the vision of the world that Europe had, I mean, you, you, Europe, you know, Eurocentric kind of vision of the world. I mean, it's it's, it's like they were spreading lies as well. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, it's a. Uh, I mean, it is. I mean, is it something that we have to be keenly aware of all the time? That what you know, like is printed, is has to be. You know, like, I mean, sometimes you know. I mean, when I was much younger, to me, it was you read a book. I mean, because it's written, there it, it goes without saying that the person is not trying to tell you lies or is yeah. not fabricating stories or you know. I mean, that there's. I mean, of course, in the universities, there's still you know, like people checking out the scholars, you know, like if they're pla for pla plagiarism or if they're like inventing things that are not real, or, you understand? I mean, there are groups of, of scholars that oversees, you know, like print, the printing thing, but it yeah. does more. I mean, you know. Yeah, no, I know. Can, it's like given to everybody to, to rewrite or to reinvent or to- Yeah. I mean, like, it's crazy. It's, it's, it's funny because like the internet, and and the internet 2.0 right like the social media sites the microblogging twitter the facebook they have amped this up and made it even worse so now there literally are multiple realities ex coexisting and and at odds with each other i mean that's really today november 8th is really you could see that on full display right if you turn on the news don't turn on the news you don't want to do that <laughs> but if you did you could see different realities forming from dissemination of lies and sometimes truths or half truths. And um, th there, that's a whole other topic. There are lots of questions though. And I wanna like 
from the Q&A and I want to just ask a couple. Can you talk about the importance of labor and craft in your work, especially in the larger works that start to take on an industrial scale? Are they actually made by hand, all you know, by, in total? By me, okay? By I, you. Yes, the only person that helps me out is like the guy that makes it sometimes, you know, he just moves things around. And yeah. he, he paints backgrounds and that's about it. Okay, I'm, I'm, that's... I'm, a, yeah, yeah, it's all by me. But and is that is that important? I mean, do you feel like that's an important aspect of the work, the labor that goes into it? it I... I love, I, I love, I'm very tactile and I'm yeah. always looking for uh, a new mediums, new support, new, I mean, I should, I mean, uh, I mean, I don't know if it's too late for me to start film, films and I mean. And, Do it, man. Yes. It's not too late. Never too late. <laughs> anyway, yeah. but uh, it's, uh, I've always liked that. And f for each project, I try to find themes, uh, and, uh, and re revisit uh, um, certain givens and put them, you know, like on a, with a new twist on them. For example, in the in the uh, um, in the uh, South Africa project, I mean, why everything is blue and white is because um, I realized. I mean, every, I mean, it's, it's a reality. I mean, it's, it's, it's the, everybody should know that. I mean, that the first ones to get there were the Dutch. So, you know, when, when one speaks Dutch, you speak Delft, and if you speak Delft, you speak China. So, you know, like, I mean, like this whole kind of, so I'm playing, and so I'm playing on the colors and the building, yeah. the building uh, uh, in uh, the National Gallery in Johannesburg is a, a Belle Epoque kind of Beaux-Arts kind of uh, Dutch uh, concoction, you know, like, which is, I mean, it has, I mean, it looks like a museum, but I mean, the details in it are very Dutch. So, yeah. uh, so yeah. was, I was playing with all of that to make sure that people realize that at least I went there and, and, and did a site specific kind of installation for them. So, um, I mean, that's the way I work. I mean, I try to make sure that, and, and I've never worked on, with mirrors before. So, I mean, like you have all these, you know, like reflective surfaces. And what I wanted to people to see is that, you know, like you see yourself in these images. I yeah. mean, it's so, I yeah. mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's crazy in South Africa. I mean, it's like the, the universities are, are getting young blacks, you know, like, and they're pumping them through the school. I mean, like universities, I mean, the, the one that the, the Johannesburg University, I forget the name exactly, but I mean, was uh, Africans a, a university and had probably, you know, like maybe 12,000, you know, like uh, students. Now there's like 60, 70,000 students, you know, like, I mean, it's like packed and yeah. all of them are studying. I mean, they're really creating the, the new cadres for their nation. So it's, it's a fascinating place. It is amazing, yeah. Uh, you, I know we're we're in your studio, and uh, I have a question about your studio because it's really amazing. And I remember right before we went on, you were rearranging some pillows in the background. So I know you're aware of the mise en scène behind right. you. No, I need to <laughs> sit down on a pillow. I mean, this chair is hard. So <laughs> yeah, but it's. I mean, let, tell me. I mean, can you talk about some of the work that's back there? Because it all looks like it comes from many different cultures. Some of it's yours, obviously, but. Yes. I mean, I, I mean, you know, I started art because I couldn't afford, you know, like buying things. So I decided to do art. But I mean, once I could, you know, I mean, like I continued my interest and I mm -hmm. like stuff and I'm very, uh, I don't get to travel that much. So I traveled through the objects that I have. So, Amazing. Okay. Uh, uh, more questions here. You have a lot of brilliant work. I agree again. Some, some of the pieces remind me of Asian uh, ancient Asian art made in darker wood, which uh, were not as colorful as yours. Yours is your work influenced by um, one or more cultures, and and could you maybe like what are yeah what are the some of the cultures? I only by Indian Chinese. I, I'm not too interested in European antiquities, you know. So because I mean I just I mean it reminds me that there's not only Europe as a yeah. source of of design of of of, of uh, objects of whatever i mean you know like there's like uh, you know uh, objects of great beauty great uh, i mean power that stems from everywhere in the planet you know that's one thing that's the most democratic is art but this you know like the art market tries to make it so 
complicated and so but you know i mean what can you do that's what it is and um, yeah but i'm really i'm interested in other cultures and the, the more um, exotic the best and i identify with them and i'm totally acquired to the indians so they don't know that and i'm not you know but i mean i really like i collect uh, uh, indian miniatures and other things like that some african uh, a lot of indian artwork um is textile based have you ever worked with textiles i've never been you were talking what were you talking about that 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 technology i mean really the the only um to me the most uh, um pervasive uh the most like world you know like uh, um tech i mean textile is like really an art that is you know like, i mean because of it's the way you build the stuff I mean, there's that many, you know, like there's not that many variations that you can do. Yes, you can do all sorts of things, but you know, like with the warps, the this. I mean, I'm not very savvy on that, but I mean, I can get confused between Guatemalan textiles and Indian textiles. I mean, you know, like which yeah. one is what? You understand? It's and it's because, I mean, the way that you, you know, like the weaving part of the thing can can really, I mean, just dictate w what will come out. Yeah, yeah. It's also interesting because now it occurs to me that Indian textile has a long history and it's all wrapped up in the British Empire, right? Like, like India, it, yeah, it, it, it became, I mean, uh, how would I say, commercialized and yeah. worldwide with the British because, I mean, that was part of and parcel of their, it, of their conquest of, in, of India. That was a jewel it, yeah. of the crown, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's funny too because well not funny but it's it's ironic again because it, it the British they sort of like invented the loom like the me mechanical loom and they met they they made it into a, a international market but by doing so they had to transfer what at that time were patented you know tech technologies in England and transfer them to other countries for large you know basically low or slave labor or low paying labor. To, to do the actual work, right? They exported the labor much in the same way that the US does now. Um, and what that wound up doing was in some ways that technology then became democratized and and no, yeah. no longer in, yeah, and it was no longer the province of the British. They kind of, by exporting it, it kind of yeah, became, lost it. They, lost control. they lost it. Yeah, they lost control of it. So it's, there is always like that silver lining to capitalism, yes. <laughs> you know, that, and, and there's, there's things that are even more, I mean, for example, you know, like the whole cotton industry, I mean, like there was a rebellion in India and no more cotton for the Liverpool mills. So, you know, like the British, as they are having war with their former colony, you know, I mean, the, with the, the American British war, I mean, they went down to the South and, and reorganized slavery, you know, because I mean, it was on the table. I mean, how can a democratic country really have slaves? I mean, yeah, like, okay. I mean, but the South decided that they were going to do business with the British. They were going to supplant, you know, like the Indian cotton and they started producing it, creating a second migration of blacks from the North to the South to, to pick cotton. I mean, and, and which ended up in a big conflagration, which was a civil war. I mean, because this was intolerable, you understand? And it created, yeah. you know, it's it's very complex kind of, you know, like history. I think, yeah, I think it's complex. It, it, I mean, it definitely is complex, but I, I do have to say that there's something about your work, um, which I don't know how to, how to say this. It, it, it kind of like, um, it softens the complexity, right? Because you you have like these giant, first of all, they're giant, these pieces, and they they have it, they tell a story, right? But the story isn't like a story you would read in a history book, although it certainly complements it. And you should read history books, right? You should read the history, but it it's it's right there. If in that first piece we saw of yours, you can see like an entire story, and it's not clear what it is until it becomes clear like you see like the hints of like the french court right but you also then see the african mass and i think the taino or the african I slaves definitely. dancing you know dancers and you start to see as you again you have to peer into it and it takes time um but you start to see the narrative forming and it's a lot more engaging than reading a textbook 
right? Or even a Wikipedia page, right? But what it what it does, I think what's valuable for tonight and for our students is that it, who are a lot of them are like they come from these countries, right? That some of them are, are, are Haitian or Dominican, uh, many in fact, uh, Puerto Rican, um, and 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 some of them have Tayano roots, right? And and they're they may feel disconnected from this history in some ways. And then here's this work, right? That kind of like Opposite. makes it in, yeah, and it, it digests it and it makes it digestible and beautiful at the same time. And I just have to say, I'm like really blown away. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have. We didn't talk too much between you and I. I feel like we did a good job. <laughs> but in one hour has passed. Yeah. The, oh, yeah. Um, oh, it blew by. This is you know we could have we have to have coffee sometime and we'll film yeah. it. And then, when you come to when you come to visit Miami. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. I I'll, I'm coming to your studio for sure. I'm going to hang out in your studio. Uh, thank you so much, Edward. Uh, Thank Thanks, you, everybody. Bob. Yes, it was. This has been great. Um, everybody, please, if you haven't gone to the show in the gallery, please go see Edward's piece and all the other pieces, of course, but focus on his for a little bit. Um, uh, next week, please join us. We're going to have the final, uh, the final in- installment of this lecture series, and um, it'll be done. It'll be great. Uh, Edward, thanks again. Have a good night. You too. Thank you so much for having me. Okay. Oh, of course. Thank you so much. It was an honor. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night, everyone. All right. Bye-bye.